How's it going, everybody? Uh, welcome back to the final installment of our Dodgers vs. Padres miniseries. So in the past few videos, we've taken a look at LA and San Diego's infield, outfield, and starting pitching, coming to the conclusion that LA's position players are slightly better and San Diego's starting pitching is slightly better. So our last category today is, of course, the bullpen. Debatably the least important out of the three, but still definitely important enough to completely destroy a season. We're going to divide this up into a closer look at both teams' top three bullpen arms, and then a broader look at the remaining pitchers in the rest of the pens. These comparisons are more about how good the pitchers will be in 2021 and going forward, so we'll look at past season's numbers and some subjective analysis to try and figure that out. It's very possible either team is still going to add some relievers before the season starts, but this video won't take that into account. Also, since most relievers only threw like 20 innings in 2020, I'll mostly be using combined 2019 and 2020 numbers unless they're particular outliers. Let's start with both teams' projected closers, which are Kenley Jansen for the Dodgers and Drew Pomeranz for the Padres. Jansen, as recently as 2017, was a top 3 reliever in baseball, and is probably a top 20 reliever in baseball history, but he's seen a pretty sharp decline since 2018. His trademarked cutter has lost a lot of velocity, he's walking more batters and giving up more home runs, and his strikeout numbers are still good, but a far cry from what they once were. Jansen, based on his name and pedigree, is expected to be elite, but over the past couple seasons he's basically been a league average closer with a couple very notable blowups. Jansen will go through stretches where his velo is good and he's recalling his old form, but those streaks are few and far between these days. His 3.61 ERA in the last two seasons is accompanied by a 3.36 FIP and solid per nines, but it's not quite the dominance you want out of a closer on a top team. While, frankly, the closer is an outdated institution, and I personally don't have an issue with Jansen closing, many fans have asked for him to be taken out of the role. As he enters his age 33 season, Jansen has to deal with continually decreasing velocity and seemingly failing control. Something he could work on is continuing to implement a slider into his repertoire. He only threw it in 10% of pitches last year, but to pretty solid effect, and at least gives batters something to think about instead of tunnel visioning on his cutter. Overall, Jansen will be a fine closer and an above average reliever in 2020. That's not really what the best team in baseball wants out of their high leverage relievers. Moving now to Drew Pomeranz, who the Padres acquired before 2020 in free agency. Pomeranz was seen as a washed up starter in 2019 with the Giants, until he was traded to Milwaukee where they converted to a full time reliever and he was lights out. Since 2019 as a reliever, he's had a 171 ERA and 211 FIP in 47 innings. His fastball went from averaging 90 as a starter to averaging 95 with elite spin rate as a reliever, and he's had a great 15 Ks per 9 proving that when he can heavily rely on his fastball curveball mix, and only has to face batters once a game he can shine in a relief role. Pomerantz combines his two pitch mix with a tricky left handed arm angle that makes it extremely hard for left handed hitters to pick up his fastball. Pomerantz's sample size is a lot smaller than Jansen's, but he's been much better than Jansen in that time frame and seems to be on the upswing while Jansen is on the downturn. Overall, I'll take Pomeranz over Jansen in a high leverage relief spot. Moving now to setup men, the Dodgers have newly re-signed Blake Trinan, while the Padres bring Emilio Pagan, who they acquired from the Rays before 2020. Trinan put up one of the best seasons for a reliever of all time in 2018 with Oakland, but in 2019 he was below average with a 4.9 ERA and a 5 FIP, putting up one of the worst walk rates in the league. In 25 innings in 2020 though, Trinan mostly fixed these issues, having his walk rate and allowing far fewer home runs, good for a 3 8 ERA and a 3 one FIP. Trinan abandoned the strikeout in 2020, with just 7.7 Ks per 9, but made up for it with fewer walks and being one of the best in baseball at inducing round balls and soft contact, due to his heavy reliance on his 97 plus mile an hour sinker. I think Trinan will continue to lean into this pitching style to avoid another disaster season like 2019, as his 2020 numbers were quite good if you ignore one or two really bad innings. If Trinan can continue to avoid walks, he should be a good pitcher, but never dominant if he can't get those strikeout numbers back up. Being a ground ball specialist that can avoid walks makes him a prime candidate to be a situational pitcher you bring in when you need to double play a ball or to pitch a 7th or 8th inning, but not really the dominance you want out of your highest leverage reliever. Emilio Pagan had a great 2019 in Tampa Bay with a 2-3 ERA and 3-3 FIP in 70 innings, but followed it up with a disappointing 2020 in San Diego with just a 4-5 ERA and a 4-7 FIP in 22 innings. Pagan in 2020 had a far lower K rate and far higher walk rate than 2019, and his strikeouts and BABIP against were career outliers. The fact that Pagan had a very lucky BABIP in 2020, but still put up poor numbers is not a good sign for him going forward. Combining the two years, Pagan has better numbers, but Trinan has a better pedigree and had a better 2020. So do you take the pitcher with a good overall career, a bad 2019, and a good small sample size 2020? 
or a pitcher with a mediocre career, a good 2019, and a bad small sample size 2020. Personally, I'll bank on trying and having the better 2021, since I think he's had a more consistent career and I like his ground ball profile more. Next down the line are the 7th inning type setup guys, and in LA it's Brewstar Gratterall, and for San Diego it's Pierce Johnson. Gratterall came over from Minnesota before 2020 and was a pretty highly touted prospect with a 100 plus mile an hour sinker and an infectious personality. Gratterall was, at times, completely unhittable in 2020 as a Dodger, where he posted a 3.09 ERA and a sparkling .9 whip. Strangely, despite being one of the five hardest throwing pitchers in baseball, Gratterall strikes out almost nobody, with just a 6.3 career K per 9 in 33 innings and just a 5 in 2020. He throws a 70-30 pitch mix between his sinker and his slider, and similar to Trident, is at his best when he's inducing soft ground balls. While Gratterall had barely any strikeouts, by all indications that should come as he becomes a more polished pitcher, and employed some strategies other than throw my 102 mile an hour sinker in the strike zone. But he did throw that sinker in the strike zone pretty often, with a surprisingly excellent 1.2 walks per 9 despite his youth and his fireballing. Gratterall has all the makings of an all-star reliever, so once he becomes more of a pitcher than a thrower, I fully expect him to grow into his stuff more. Zips is projecting him for a good season in 2021, even though he's only projected for around a 6.5k per 9. If Gratterall can bloom into the 10 plus strikeouts per 9 pitcher his stuff should allow while maintaining his good control, which I think could happen as soon as 2021, he should be one of baseball's premier relievers. Pierce Johnson is a 30 year old journeyman reliever who put up his better of two career seasons in 2020 with the Padres, where he had a 2.7 ERA and 3.14 FIP in 20 innings. Johnson was a first round draft pick in 2012 for the Cubs. While he never really had extreme prospect pedigree, he got his best chance of his career in 2020 with San Diego and he ran with it. His 12 Ks per 9 put him near the top of the Padres bullpen and led to the Padres trusting him with some high leverage playoff innings. Johnson throws a 60-40 curveball sinker mix, with his curve being the gem of his repertoire and his main out pitch. As a prospect, Johnson had walk concerns and he hasn't really quelled those with a career 4.5 walks per 9. Johnson should be an above average reliever due to his strikeout ability, but his lack of command limits his ceiling. Between the two, Gratterall has far more upside due to his youth, his prospect pedigree, and his command, but Johnson should still be a solid reliever in 2021. The remainders of both bullpens have a lot of parallels. Both teams have a sidearm lefty specialist in Tim Hill and Adam Kalarik. Both teams have veteran righties with Craig Stammen and Joe Kelly. Both have high spin rate, high upside, newish acquisitions in Austin Adams and Corey Knebel. And finally, both have left-handed multi-inning relief options with Matt Strom and Victor Gonzalez. Going down the line, Clark has a pretty clear edge over Hill, with Clark having a sub-1 ERA and 30 innings since being traded to Los Angeles in mid-2019. Between Stammen and Kelly, Stammen had a 5 ERA in 2020 but with pretty great peripherals. While Kelly was good in a pretty limited sample size, and was terrible in the first half of 2019 but pretty great in the second half, Kelly has much more promising strikeout stuff with a high 90s fastball and elite spin rate on his curve, while Stammen is much more of a finesse pitcher relying on not walking guys and inducing soft contact. In my eyes, Kelly has far more upside while Stammen is a safer pick, so I'll say it's a toss up between the two with maybe a slight edge to Kelly. Austin Adams and Corey Knable are both hard throwers with very promising spin rates, capable of striking out more than 10 batters per 9. Knable definitely has the better track record, but missed 2019 and much of 2020 with Tommy John surgery. Adams has been in the league for 4 seasons, but despite great stuff with a career 15 Ks per 9, he's only pitched 43 career innings due to a scary 6.2 walks per 9. If Adams can throw more strikes, he could be an all-star, while Knable is more unknown due to injury concerns and not being great since 2018, so tentatively I'll give Adams a slight edge for 2021. Finally, between Victor Gonzalez and Matt Strom, Strom had more prospect pedigree and a lot more major league experience, but Gonzalez was absolutely electric in 20 innings in his rookie season in 2020. He had very few walks, didn't allow a single home run, and had more than 10 k per 9 good for a 1-3-3 ERA and 1-6-7 FIP. Strom was also pretty good in 20 innings in 2020 with a 2-6-1 ERA, but he had a sort of scary 6.5 Ks per 9, which meant his FIP was just 4-9-3. These strikeout numbers are far below his career average, so they're probably an outlier, but as of right now, I'd bank on Gonzalez a little over Strom for 2021. So while the Padres have the edge in terms of their closer, I think the Dodgers have better 7th and 8th inning guys, and slightly better middle and long relievers, making their bullpen better overall. The Dodgers also come out on top in depth, with proven guys like Dylan Floro and Scott Alexander ready to contribute. Both bullpens are good, with the Dodgers having the makings of a top 5 or 6 pen, while the Padres are more in the top 10 range. 
I think the Padres are pretty likely to still add another bullpen arm, like bringing back Trevor Rosenthal, so that could definitely change some things in the future. And that concludes our little mini-series, so we've come to the conclusion that the Dodgers have a slightly better lineup and bullpen, while the Padres have a small edge in starting pitching, and with a recent re-signing of Jerickson Profar, probably a slight edge on the bench as well. There's no question the Dodgers and Padres are two of the three best teams in the National League and the cream of the crop in baseball. It's hard to go against the reigning World Series champs, and as of right now, I think the Dodgers are a little bit better, but the Padres come as close as any other team in baseball at overtaking them. Thanks to everybody for watching this week's videos, and if you haven't gotten a chance, I hope you check out the previous three and some of the other videos on the channel. I'm pretty new to YouTube, so seeing your guys' support has been awesome, and I really appreciate it. As always, thanks for watching. If you're enjoying the content, sub to the channel, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.